Hello, thank you and um, welcome as we look at symbolist art, focusing on the work of a few artists to get a sense of the main themes and characteristics of the symbolist art movement. A symbolism in art developed in the last two decades of the 19th century and occurred in all forms of art, including literature, theater, and music. It developed earlier in literature, but in the visual arts, symbolism was most prominent uh, in the later part of the century uh, and was active prominently um, or preeminently in Scandinavia, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and the German-speaking regions. Uh, as with any art movement, symbolism was closely connected to the social and historical moment in which it developed. So in talking about symbolist art today, we'll also be looking at some of the cultural currents that were contemporary with it. We'll look at art by several different symbolists, picking out some of the most iconic or intriguing highlights of the movement for our, our attention, while concentrating on the most popular topics for symbolist artists. Traditionally, Western artists have sought to reproduce nature and reality, but through an idealized lens. They took their cues from nature, but would eliminate what they saw as a flaw, uh, what they would arrange forms to be visually pleasing, and they would essentially modify the real to and achieve an ideal of beauty. Well, in the 1870s onwards, the Impressionists reacted against this, trying to reproduce optical experience in everyday life. So their painting techniques are trying to capture the way we actually visually perceive things. They like scenes that seem casual and unplanned, and they strictly focused on topics that were common to everyday life, like Claude Monet's scene of a moment before or after lunch in the garden, with a child playing off to the left of the table and two women strolling in the background, and various naps, parasols, uh, and a hat stab scattered casually around in an informal, everyday moment. Now, the Impressionists were all about rendering contemporary, everyday reality as they saw it. What you see in an Impressionist work is really what you get. With this other painting by Monet, for example, if we know that railroads were new to France and that they allowed Parisians to take day trips to the suburbs for leisure, we might have a richer understanding of the context in which Monet painted, but it won't necessarily change the meaning of the painting itself. It's still a painting of a railway bridge going over a river with leisure craft sailing boats on it. In many ways, symbolism is really the opposite of Impressionism. Symbolists, by contrast, used images as a means for conveying feelings, ideas, and moods, not optical reality. The image is a symbol, in a sense, an attempt to depict something that cannot be pictured, to show something that can't be seen. But these aren't usually symbolic in the way that language, say, is symbolic. Art has always used symbols, like we see here in this funerary monument from Imperial Rome. But in this case, the symbols work like a language so that you can look at the different figures and translate the meaning. The deceased emperor and empress are being carried into eternity and bid a respectful farewell by Rome and the Campus Martius, the site where this monument is located. One could write the words out and have pretty much the exact same meaning as the image and very little would be lost in the translation. But symbolist art is much less explicit, much less clear. We can't look at a symbolist painting and dissect it into a series of discrete codes. Sometimes they use figures that represent specific ideas, but often it's the ensemble, the whole work, that generates the feeling or mood. It's the work in its entirety uh, that is the symbol for something that lies beyond representation. So here, for example, the Belgian artist Ferdinand Knopf gives us a very straightforward representation of the square in the city of Bruges, except that all life has been stripped away, including any surrounding buildings and even the statue that sits in the middle of the square. To the right, just a hint of blue in all of the gray, the sea has drifted up into the square, adding to this sense of abandonment like the elements are reclaiming the city. It's strange, eerie, and beautifully haunting. 
if you were to verbally describe this image to someone, you'd have to use very poetic language in order to convey the same feeling as you get from looking at the image. Well, in this symbolist painting by Gustav Klimt, it's abundantly clear from the first glance that there is some meaning here, some wordless message. And if we learn more, we can understand more clearly what that message is. But even without that additional information, we still get a feeling or a vibe from the work. We can still find it disturbing or unsettling or strange. Monet's railway bridge may be just a railway bridge, but Klimt's women are facades for something threatening that we can't quite put a name on yet. In our overview of symbolist art today, we'll be focusing on the work of five artists. From the Italian Alps, Giovanni Segantini. From Norway, Edvard Munch. Max Klinger from G Germany. Gustav Klimt from Austria. And from Finland, Akseli Galenkaloa. As we'll see, symbolism did not have a distinct technique or method. Segantini, Klinger, and Galen Kalela adhered to a naturalistic approach that looked to traditional art and to the appearance of reality. Munch, as we see here, tended to use very broad, thick paint strokes, almost flat colors, and simplified forms. Klimt, on the other hand, delighted in intricate detail, line, and surface pattern. Instead of technique or style, it was the themes and the approach to art that marks these artists as symbolist. Together, they depict the main subjects of symbolism, the nature and roles of women, the realm of the subconscious, the decay and degeneracy of human society, and the struggles and particularities of existence itself. The ways in which these topics were approached varied. Sometimes the attitude is very pessimistic and dark. Other times, it's more mystical and mysterious. It's less common to find joyful images in symbolism, although some do express a celebration of life and love. Most symbolist art conveys something about the vague and expressible and even unspeakable part of human experience. Much of it doesn't make sense because it isn't about reason or logic. Instead, irrationality, emotion, desire, fear, the primeval forces that lurk at the edges of our so-called civilized daily existence and in the dark corners of our hearts and minds. This is the realm of the symbolists. In fact, much symbolist art anticipates the work of Sigmund Freud that would come decades later. Freud didn't develop his theories of the unconscious and human sexuality until the 19-teens and 20s, but dreams, the unconscious, and the hidden desires of the mind were already very much subjects floating in the cultural awareness of the late 19th century Europe. There was also a distinct anxiety surrounding sex due to the increasing numbers of sexually transmitted diseases, a declining birth rate, fears about de genetic degradation of humanity, uncertainty about the shifting roles of women, and really a generalized concern with what some had come to see as an unhealthy decadence in the prosperity of modern society. Now, to my knowledge, there were no female symbolist artists, yet women are the most common subject of symbolist art. They fall into two types. There's the femme fatale, who is a deadly seductress using her sexuality to trap and destroy men. And the opposite is the angel, the woman whose sexuality is directed towards being a loving wife and mother. The ultimate example of this archetype is the Virgin Mary, whereas Eve is the original femme fatale. Images of the femme fatale, like this painting by Franz von Stuck, have an open, aggressive eroticism that was almost totally absent from art prior to this. You certainly had erotic art, some of it actually pretty explicit, uh, but this confrontational aggressive quality uh, is quite new. The snake wrapped around the woman's torso looks straight out at us, but it really just adds to the sense of danger that she already projects. It's like the snake is a kind of underlining of the femme fatale's deadly transgressive sinful status. There'd certainly been erotic paintings, as I said, but this is really uh, new. It's a, an extremely popular sort of genre with the symbolists. 
Giovanni Segantini's work gives us one of the clearest demonstrations of this binary. Here, we see an example of the positive maternal energy and earthiness of the Madonna archetype in the nursing mother. This particular woman who we see here is not really an individual, but instead representative of maternity as a whole, the very idea of motherhood, that state of being, which extends to animals like the cow and her calf here. Motherhood was the role that Segantini saw as the highest state of femininity. The mother fits into the archetype of the Madonna, and Segantini was a kind of Marian pantheist. He saw nature as being an extension of divine love and life that was embodied in Mary. In this image of entitled Life, uh, you can see in the bottom left corner, there is a kind of uh, mother and child image of Mary and baby Jesus. Segantini was raised Catholic at a time when the Catholic Church was promoting the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. In 1854, Pope Pius IX declared that Mary herself had been conceived through the miraculous intervention of the Holy Spirit, instead of being the natural offspring of her parents, Joachim and Anna. By making this official Catholic doctrine, the Pope elevated Mary's already high status in the Church and promoted the ideal of a mother who is not soiled by the earthly indignity of sex and erotic desire. Of course, for every other human being prior to the development of in vitro fertilization and similar methods, this is impossible. Women were implicitly and explicitly held to a standard of, standard of expectation that was biologically impossible. Women, it was believed, should have sex with their husbands, but should not receive an undue amount of pleasure from intercourse. In, some, in fact, some doctors instructed husbands to avoid provoking unhealthy excitement in their wives, by visiting them as rarely and quickly as possible. They should then become pregnant, bear healthy children, and raise them with devotion, tenderness, and love. But one can see how, if this is the ideal, it would be easy to fall short. Women who couldn't conceive, who had miscarriages or stillbirths, who didn't have the internal resources or energy or inclination to dote on their children, uh, who had desires and ambitions outside of that narrow example set by the Virgin Mary, one may aspire to emulate the Madonna, but living a life comparable to that of the earthly mother of God, that's not exactly low pressure. Segantini himself had seven children with his wife, Bice. They lived in the Italian Alps where Segantini painted massive canvases that presented his native landscape as a place where his ideal of maternal womanhood could flourish, a place in which the fertility and creative beauty of nature is an extension of the fertility and creative beauty of woman, a kind of alpine Eden. Motherhood was a supremely divine state to Segantini. He's famously quoted as saying, I love and respect any woman in whatever walk of life if she, if she has the look of a mother. Love, respect, and honor womankind, for they granted us life and gave us love. Well, just as the most important, sacred, and beautiful guise a woman could take on was that of a mother, the most despicable expression of cruelty and evil for Segantini was a woman who denied the role of mother, either via abortion, child abandonment, or celibacy, what we might call the anti-mother. Segantini imagined a particular fate for these women. This is one of only two really negative images produced by Segantini, and it's entitled The Evil Mothers. It shows the eternal suspension of anti-mothers in these soulless and broken wastelands, bound to cold, leafless trees until they find forgiveness from the souls of their unwanted children, who emerge as a bud from the tree to suckle at the breast of the anti-mother. This is the ultimate in redemption and forgiveness. The child who was denied the life-giving milk and love of the mother now is what pulls the anti-mother out of the purgatorial wasteland by lending its mouth to the barren breast. Notice how the branches of the more distant tree on the left look almost like branching veins, as if the tree is part of the human arterial system, so that nature, humanity, and the concepts of life, love, forgiveness are all wrapped up together, as if they're all really the same thing. The whole image is very strange, very otherworldly, and very haunting. It would be very difficult to draw a clearer distinction than is done in Segantini's work. 
the good mother, the life-giving Madonna versus the evil mother and Eve, who was tempted by the devil and is in turn tempted by her husband, or in turn, excuse me, it tempted her husband, Adam, thus causing humanity to fall from its immortal harmony with God into its current mortality and sinfulness. This is the other uh, of the pair that goes with the evil mothers. It's entitled The Punishment of Lust. And in true symbolist form, everything is left vague. How exactly are these lustful women being punished? Uh, they seem to be in a state of suspended animation floating above the frozen plain. It's all very otherworldly. It's not frightening, but strange, barren, and cold. If Segantini's idea of harmony, life, and peace is a thriving alpine farm with calves, cows, ponds, flowers, then this place or this state of being is far from that ideal. The landscape that we see is the mirror of these women's internal state of being. In terms of technique, Segantini practices something called divisionism, which was popular at this time among Italian artists. And it consists of constructing the painting using very small strokes of individual color that are not blended together. This means that even when you look at a close-up of a divi divisionist painting, it still seems blurry, like the resolution isn't high enough or something. This technique adds to the tension and the otherworldliness of Segantini's paintings by giving us a scene that we can see almost perfectly, but which is always denying us a clear view. So there's always this underlying tension, this underlying discomfort with his images, simply due to this technique. We see the characterization of aberrant women in Klimt's work as well. Women were, in fact, pretty much the only thing that Klimt ever painted. They could be real women, like portraits, or they might be legendary, like the Jewish heroine Judith, whom we see here, or they could be anonymous, idealized beauties, or they could be the dangerous but still attractive femme fatale. In 1897, a group of Austrian artists resigned from the official Association of Austrian Artists, which they saw as being too traditional and confining, much as the French Impressionists had done a couple decades earlier. These dissenters established the Vienna Secession Group and held regular exhibitions on their own. The 14th exhibition in 1902 was dedicated to the legacy of the great romantic composer Ludwig von Beethoven. Klimt created a large frieze meant to be a visual representation of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which includes the famous Ode to Joy. In this Beethoven frieze, as it's called, the term deadly woman takes on a particularly sharp meaning, as Klimt has used the female form to present the different diseases and social ills that stand between humanity and joy. The identification of these figures varies, but the woman and women in the left foreground are the monstrous gorgons from Greek mythology. The skeletal figures above them represent sickness, madness, and death. Some identify the figure leaning forward as syphilis, which was a major problem at this time. The placement of these highly stylized figures next to this massive gorilla-like monster adds a level of strangeness and grotesqueness through the juxtaposition. The monster is Typhus, who was the father of all monsters in Greek mythology. His name also comes from the same wor root word as that of typhoid, the deadly bacterial disease. To the right of Typhus are lust or obscenity with her red hair. Um, to her right is wantonness and heartlessness. And in the foreground, gluttony or debauchery. Farther right, framed by Typhus's massive wings and snake body, is gnawing anxiety and fear. Again, what gives this image its power is not simply these personifications, but their depiction the way in which they are presented, their arrangement, the cramped and claustrophobic feeling in which we have this barrage of intricate details. This is a case in which the whole is truly greater than the sum of its parts. It's the creepily distorted skeletal figures peering out at us, paired with the unapologetically erotic yet hostile women, accompanied by the gigantic typhoid monster. 
they and the mood that they collectively project are the degeneracy and decay of modern society. Now, as you might be able to guess, Klimt was a fan of the philosophers Friedrich Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, both of whom took a very dim, nihilistic, and pessimistic view of humanity and the future. In the Beethoven frieze, however, these malevolent forces are overcome through poetry and the arts, which leads to the happy ending we see here, where Klimt captures the triumphant feeling of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Beethoven's composition was, in turn, the musical interpretation of a poem by Friedrich Schiller, which ends with the line, Joy, lovely spark of heaven's fire, this embrace for all the world. Here we see this embrace, enshrined in a gold and radiant waves of heat, flanked by a heavenly choir of angels whose peaceful orderliness contrasts with the twisted chaos of the malevolent forces. Everything is these radiant, gold, warm, red tones, and whereas we had many angles and twisting forms in the malevolent forces, here things are more sinuous, more graceful. Note how the two uh, figures who are intertwined kissing on the right have uh, this sort of string wrapped around their feet as a representation of water. And then on either side, we have these rose bushes branching up that then at the top radiate fire uh, and up into the heavens where we have the sun and the moon. So encapsulating this idea of an embrace for all the world, the entire cosmos is caught up in this embrace. Another artist who participated in the Vienna Secession was the German Max Klinger, who worked with many different media, including sculpture, painting, and printmaking, like you see here. He was an excellent draftsman, and the technique and style of representation that he uses are quite traditional. It's the subject matter and the way that he arranges his images that make them seem strange, often dreamlike or hallucinatory. He often created series of prints that told a story, but without any text to explain how they were connected. So we are presented, for example, with this image of a tiger at the end of a narrow mountain passage confronting us, blocking us. What is the tiger doing there? We're not sure, but there's this forceful, ominous, portentous, but also intriguing quality to it. A Klinger is perhaps most um, known for a series of prints that loosely tell the story of a woman's lost love. There's no text to accompany these images, so we are left with many questions. The story begins straightforwardly enough, though. A man, possibly Klinger himself, finds a single glove at the skating rink that has been dropped by some woman. Notice the clever way that Klinger has arranged the scene, placing the figures in alternating diagonals to create a rhythm that is interrupted by the motion of the man picking up the glove, so that it feels like there's a sudden break, like a sweeping motion and then an interruption, something that's just taken us away from the regular pattern, pattern of life and off into a tangent of the unreal or surreal. The man takes the glove home, where it soon takes on a life and a presence of its own, haunting his dreams and consuming his thoughts so that the glove is a stand-in for the unknown beloved, a malevolent force, and a vulnerable object of desire all at once. Here, the glove creeps into his dreams with anxieties and fears, clawing at the man, trapping him in the corner of his own psyche as he clutches at blankets trapped pushed against the wall, a gigantic glove with the moon rising behind it is in the background. And then this tidal wave uh, washes up on the shore of his bed. We have two additional gloves uh, reaching out from the left side. And then in between this conglomeration of figures, of monsters, fears, anxieties. Here, the glove is tossed about on a stormy sea, you can see it in the bottom left, and risks being lost forever to the depths. Here, notice how Klinger has arranged the composition so that the ship is high up on the wave, and the vertical orientation of the image emphasizes the sense of height, the sense of height, this rising up, the swelling of the wave in this, that, this uh, massive storm. When it returns to shore, the glove rests on a rock to the left, flanked by two burning torches, burning lamps. The obsessive power of the glove has 
infected the ocean when it contacted it, it seems, uh, and sparked the desire and yearning of the sea itself, which tosses wave upon wave of roses to the glove in adoration. The most striking and fabulous image of the series, however, is the abduction of the glove by this pterodactyl-like creature. I love this picture. <laughs> it is so brilliantly composed and so strangely enthralling. It's creepy, but fascinating. In terms of the construction of the image, notice how Klinger has arranged everything along this horizontal line, emphasizing the swift and sudden flight. The flowering shrub below the window to the left adds, or adds a sense of uh, domestic normalcy that makes the appearance of this pterodactyl even stranger and more out of place. Here we have this lovely garden and this monstrous reptile is flying over it. Notice the flower petals tumbling to the ground at the bottom left, shaken by the passing motion of the kidnapper. The window glass is shattered as two arms desperately reach out to recover the glove, but the cross pieces of the window itself hold them back, trapped inside while the object of desire is carried away beyond reach. What's even more interesting is that the window has not been broken by the pterodactyl as it exited with the glove. Did it pass through the window like a ghost or a thought? Did the window open of its own accord to let the pterodactyl pass, but closes on the man trapping him inside his own psyche? The image leaves us with so many intriguingly odd questions. I've only shown you a few images from the series, but even when you view it as a whole, there are more questions than answers, and that's really the point. The fact that there is no answer is suggested by the fact that Klinger himself displayed the various prints in two different orders, suggesting different narratives. Our desire for an explanation, our desire to know and understand, is precisely the sort of reasoned impulse that is intentionally thwarted both by these images and by the mysterious subconscious world of dreams and desires that haunts all of our minds. The terrible uncertainty and pain of life and human existence is highlighted in the work of Edvard Munch. It is important to note that Munch, as you can see here, was perfectly capable of painting in a more conventional manner that really looked towards uh, visual appearance and reality in the way that the Impressionists did. This means that his choice to diverge from this technique was intentional and meant to achieve a specific effect that Munch found lacking in other methods. Here, for example, he depicts the various phases of a romantic relationship between a man and a woman. It's titled The Dance of Life, and we see, indeed, couples dancing on this flat green plain with the sun setting or rising over the sea in the distance. The story or meaning occurs in two different directions, first from left to right across the foreground, and then from back in the distance towards the front. Monk liked to uh, show the passage of time by having the distance be the past and what's closest to the surface is the present. That was a common technique that he used in his work. We see in the background a solitary girl standing on the edge of the green field waiting for a partner. In the middle distance, she's caught up in the dance by at least two male partners, one with dark hair on the left, and then to the right, it seems like She's being pulled away from her original partner. We see her in the white dress just to the right of the red dressed woman uh, and seems to be two men dressed in black. And then a little bit closer, we find her in the arms of a rather grotesquely leering man as her blonde hair has turned red, indicating her erotic appeal. In the foreground, we have the chaste, blonde young woman in her white and gold dress, smiling innocently and her arms open as if she's about to raise them and reach out to someone. Next to her is a single flower, almost touching her left hand, indicating new life, hope, and fresh beauty. In the center, she has metamorphosed through sexual union with the man and her loose red hair and gown indicate this new identity as a sexual erotic being. Finally, to the right, her hair is somewhere between red and blonde. She's dressed in black, her hands severely clasped closed and clamped over her pubic area. What are we to make of all of this? 
Munk had very ambivalent attitudes towards women. He was, even some might say, terrified of them, uh, seeing them as inherently threatening femme fatales who actually drained the creative energy from men. You can see this in the way that in the central figure, the train of the red dress is covering the man's feet. It's almost like a pool of blood that is swallowing him up. He's being caught in this embrace, trapped. For Munch, women seem to be innocent until the awakening of their sexuality, which then, it seems, inevitably leads to, leads to death, pain, and loss, as we see on the right. Munch believed that the purpose of woman was simply to bear children and to continue the human species. Thus, after her childbearing years, a woman is essentially dead, thus the mournful black dress of the older woman. When we learn more about the personal life of Edvard Munch, we can decipher this story a little further. We know that a young woman named Mathilde or Tula Larsen fell in love with Munch, who was totally disinterested and really even harsh towards her, trying to discourage her. Yet somehow they continued to stay together for four years. Tula became increasingly desperate. Um, she really wanted to marry Munch. He really didn't. And eventually Tula either attempted or faked an attempted suicide. The climax backs of the mess came when there was some kind of confrontation during which Munch had one of his left fingers shot off with a revolver. Tula called a doctor and she and Munch never saw each other again. Considered in this light, we can see the dance of life as the story of Tula and Munch in which things are fine until Tula's erotic love and desire for a sexual relationship enters the scene capturing Monk, threatening to suck him dry of his creative energy, and resulting finally in broken-hearted grief. Munk created one of the most famous images in art history and one of the best-known images of existential de despair and anxiety. He in fact produced multiple versions of the scream, but this is the best known, located at the National Museum in Norway. A year earlier, Munch had wrote, written the following, quote, I was walking along the road with two friends. Then the sun went down. Suddenly the sky turned blood red and I felt a breath of melancholy, an exhausting pain under my heart. I paused, leaning against the fence, tired to death. Above the blue black fjord and city, there was blood and tongues of fire. My friends went on, and I stood there, trembling with anxiety, and I felt that a great, infinite scream went through nature. This moment, this feeling of a great, infinite scream going through nature is what Munch is showing us. We see the two friends in the background, reduced to these kind of narrow, almost ghostly silhouettes, apparently unaware of this existential tremor. To the right, the city, hills, and fjord rush together in a curving stream of color and energy that blends with the sky. It's a very simple composition and seems straightforward enough, but there's a great deal of ambiguity here. Is the screaming figure nature? Is it the embodiment of the scream? Is it Munch experiencing the scream passing through nature? In a way, I think the answer is yes to all of these all at once. The animated waves of blood red in the sky, the sharp, almost violent diagonal of the fence that runs from the left background to the foreground in this vertiginous slope, piercing through the figure, the skull-like head, the whole painting conveys not a moment per se, but the feeling of a moment, the experience of a moment. The scream is sometimes considered an example of expressionist painting, a later movement that embraced highly stylized forms like Munch does in order to express the inner emotions and feelings of the artist. Whereas symbolism can look very traditional and realistic in its representation of forms, expressionism tends towards abstraction in the pursuit of expressing internal feelings. Now, lest you leave with the impression that symbolism is all dark and warped and tragic, much of it is, uh, but we'll finish with two paintings by the Finnish artist Akseli Galankalela. This is a very different kind of symbolism. Nothing here is strange, neither the method nor the subject. Galen Kalila uses a beautiful, somewhat loose application of paint that adds a kind of soft and natural aliveness to his images. It's incredibly simple and yet also very vibrant. 
They look very naturalistic, but are also masterpieces of simplicity. We are looking at a young country boy who is looking at or past a crow who is inspecting something on the ground. The very simplicity of this image makes it feel very portentous, very meaningful. There's this ineffable aura of mystery here, as if we're seeing a moment in a fairy tale almost. This juxtaposition, this contrast, this almost conflict between the boy and the crow. Can someone present something so simple to us without there being a meaning to it? That's what our, our minds ask us. What, what's happening here? What does this mean? Notice the angle from which we view the scene, elevated as if we're much taller than the boy, maybe even floating. But the ground doesn't actually seem to be beneath us. It too seems to float, and with no horizon line or other point of reference, it's hard to find a visual anchor. And this disorientation adds to the mysterious quality, the otherworldliness, the fantasy quality of the work. Galen Kalala was working at a time when Finland was defining its identity as a nation independent from the Russian Empire, to which it still belonged. He was very proud of his Finnish identity and heritage, and his landscapes, like this painting of a remote lake, has a weightiness to its depiction that makes it seem more like than just a lake. For example, compare Galen Kalala's painting to this work by Monet, showing the canal at Zandam in Holland. You might say that this is an unfair comparison, since Monet is presenting us with an inhabited water line. We have houses along the shore, but that's the point. Impressionism was much more interested in landscapes as a setting for everyday human activity. The inhabited landscapes, the domesticated landscapes, you might say, as a setting for leisure or a household or something like that. Monet's scene doesn't have a spiritual quality to it. At this moment in his career, he's really interested in depicting a stretch of the riverbank as such. In Axeligal and Kalela's painting of the lake, the swooping line that you see snaking across the surface is caused by naturally occurring currents in the lake. But in Finnish legends, it was said to be the remnant of the wave caused by the great hero Benamoinen as he rode across the water. So the lake that we see here is simultaneously both a lake and also the surface symbol for a love of nature, a love of country, a sense of history and heritage, uh, and an affection for the old legends, and a desire for freedom and independence. This is a fairly small painting, but it has this expansive quality to it, as if we're looking at something more than simply the surface of the lake. There's this importance to it, this significance that Axel Egal and Kalela gives it. Somehow it feels like we're seeing something much deeper, much more mysterious, something that words can't quite express, nor the mind pin down. This is what symbolism is all about the perpetual quest to represent what lies just beyond representation and understanding. Thank you.